Um, we've been talking about the sort of journey of, of Arise for a while now and where we've come from, where we're going. Um, last week, uh, I threw out the thought a few weeks ago that, that, that a local body of believers needs probably three things to really impact a community. Um, and, and we want to go... In order to impact a community, a, a local body, before it can impact a community, it needs to have influence in that community, and you don't get influence in a community until you get involvement in a community. So you can sit in a holy huddle and just pray and talk about the problems of a community and, and, and even come up with solutions to the problems in a community, but if you don't do something with that and you don't get outside the walls of your church, your building, and actually engage with the community, get involved in things, um, nothing really changes. Um, I believe in prayer, massively in the power of prayer, but I've said over the last couple of weeks that sometimes, sometimes prayer can be a great thing for us to hide behind so that we don't have to do anything else. We feel like we're making a great difference and we feel like we're doing what God wants because we're praying, but you don't have to read far into the New Testament or even the Old Testament to see that God wants his people to do more than just say prayers. We need to be praying, but he wants us also to get out there and get our hands dirty, amen? He wants us to get out and get involved in the problems of the world. We can sit here and talk about how the world is going in a direction that's terrible and bad, um, but what alternatives are we providing to the community? What other options are we giving people to think about? What other worldviews are we presenting to people? Um, and if we just stay silent and do nothing, then um, you know, the world will continue to go the way that it's, uh, the, 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 that it's going, and we have a role to play. Uh, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We've all heard that saying before, and it's such a wonderful saying. We should put it on some T-shirts, I'm the hands and feet of Jesus. But if you're a person that's not walking and doing anything or putting your hand to any plows, then it's nothing more than a slogan on a T-shirt, amen? And we don't want to be a community of people that just know all the Christian slogans. We, 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 we've been put here for a reason. And the last couple of weeks, we've kind of unpacked that reason a little bit, and I don't want to go over that ground again. If you jump on our... Uh, I think there's a, a YouTube channel there. You can catch up on those uh, two messages over the last couple of weeks. And in order for a church to, to get involved in a community, I think there are three simple little things that any body of believers needs. And uh, the first one uh, was finances and uh, time and creativity. Those three things. If a, a body of believers can come together and, br and, 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 come together and bring finance and bring uh, uh, time and bring creativity, I think there are a lot of great things that we can do in terms of trying to impact our community. Last week, we spent a bit of time talking about finance. It was about the seventh time in 10 years we've even talked about money in the life of Arise. So if you came last week for the first time, you're probably sitting there going, no, no, you talk about it every week. You've only been here one week, right? Okay, so hang around a bit more and you'll get an idea of, of what we're talking about. I want to move on um, this week and start and have a little look at time, what time means. Before I do, in John chapter four, there's a story there. We all know this story. We've read it uh, Plenty of times if you hung around church long enough. Uh, it's a story of the woman at the well. And John chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, it starts, it says, Now, he being Jesus, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Um, if you know geography and you know the way that the Jews traveled, the truth is he didn't need to go through Samaria. That makes it sound like Jesus needed to go there because of a geographical purpose. The road kind of went through there. But if you, you go back and you look at the geography and you understand the culture of the day, Jews didn't uh, fraternize with Samaritans. Jews thought they were pure bloods and they saw Samaritans as kind of half-caste uh, uh, Jews and they called them dogs. That was a slogan they used. They, they didn't look very favorably upon them and they stayed away from them. And so if you, you, you look at the traveling Jesus is doing, he's basically starting down here and he's got to go here and Samaria's right in the middle. What most good Jews did is they crossed the river, went up the other side, recrossed the river and entered into, continued their journey. Jesus didn't. So when it says here that he needed to go through Samaria, he had to go through Samaria, this is not because of a natural reason, but in his spirit, there was a reason why he had to go. He, he knew there was a, an urgency, or, or if I could put it this way, he, he, if he was just doing things according to man's ways, he would have gone the way men went, but he was attuned to the fact that God has a way. Amen? He was attuned to the fact that not only do we live in this world to go about the affairs of man, but we also have a role to play in the affairs of God. Amen? God has things that he wants to see happen down here. God has plans and purposes for humanity. Just as I uh, am born and I grow up and you know, when you're young at school, you, 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 you go to school and you, you know, you're expected to get great grades and uh, you know, then you're expected to have a plan to go to maybe, maybe it's university or jump into a trade. Or you know, We've got these plans and purposes for children as they grow up. Well, our Heavenly Father also has plans and purposes for us too that he's hoping we'll step into as well. And sometimes the plans and purposes of God uh, have different rewards to them, don't they? 
They have different rewards. Uh, Jesus said, don't just store up uh, 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 things for yourself down here on earth where moth and rust are going to destroy, but he said, store up treasures in heaven. Now, I don't want to argue about what treasures in heaven look like, but the point's very clear. He said you can spend your whole life trying to build up the things that this world says you need to have for purposes of looking great or succeeding in the world, or you can realize that there is a little bit more to that. And, and, and sometimes God's rewards are not the same as ours. There are plenty of people that have done great things for the Lord that could have gone and done great things, for example, in the corporate world or in the, in, in the uh, uh, profit-making world. But they've taken their skills and so on. They've given up livelihoods. They've given up stuff to go to far nations and preach the gospel to people that don't know the story of Jesus. Or they've spent their life you know, uh, translating uh, the, the good news into different foreign languages when they probably could have been great writers and made names for themselves as screenwriters or whatever. There have been a lot of people that have sacrificed the rewards of the world for the sake of the rewards of the kingdom, knowing that one day when I get to heaven, there's that old saying, you can't take it with you, can you? I can't take all this stuff with you. Now, I'm not an extremist saying you shouldn't have anything, give everything away. I'm not that because the Word of God also talks very clearly about you've got to look after your family. Amen? You've got to, you've got to look after those that are in need and so on. So, uh, you know, in, some people will say in the book of Acts, it says there that, you know, when the church was birthed, that they sold everything and they gave all the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But then a couple of verses later, it says, but then they met in people's homes and prayed. Well, not everybody sold their home and gave everything away. Otherwise, that doesn't make sense does it? So we don't want to be extremists. But the point is that God has an agenda and there are things that God wants to do. And I believe there are things that God wants to do in this community called Lismore in which we find ourselves in at the moment. Amen? That's how I feel. And so it says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. It says, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And we know the rest of the story. He said to his disciples, you guys go in town and do the shopping. Uh, and Jesus stayed out of town while the disciples did the shopping. And a woman came out to draw water at the well. And then Jesus gets into this conversation with this uh, woman at a well. And as the conversation goes on, I love the way that Jesus interacts with people. You can go and read it yourself. He doesn't tell her what to believe. He takes her on a journey to understand and start to believe and gain her own faith. Yeah, sometimes we're so quick just to tell people this is just the way it is, and it might be true, but it doesn't matter what you believe. Find out what people believe and take them on a journey. Amen? Take them on a journey. Show them. Show them why we believe what we believe, not just tell them what we believe. We believe. And he takes this woman on this journey, and then she rushes back into town because she's really excited about this encounter she's had with this guy. She comes to the conclusion. She says, you know, we know that a Messiah is going to come eventually, and Jesus just lays it out for her and goes, well, bang, here I am. As she runs back into town, and she tells the townspeople, come and see a man who told me everything there was about my life. Come, come and see this man. He's out there. He knew stuff about me that nobody could have possibly known. In fact, he knew stuff about me, yet he still spoke to me when some of you in this city probably don't think highly of me because of some of the things that I have done. But he still took time with me, and he knew what you knew. Come and meet this man. And she brings them out. But when the disciples come back in verse 27, it says, Just then his disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want? or Why are you talking with her? And then leaving her water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, while this is happening, Jesus' disciples urged him. They said, Rabbi, eat something. You just sent us in to get food. You are hungry. We've got food for you to eat. But he said to them, I've I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And Jesus said this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he turns to them in verse 35. And he says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes. Everyone say, open your eyes. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. This woman had this encounter with Jesus. She ran back into town and she tells all these people in town about the Messiah that's just kind of just outside there up where the well is. Come and meet him. The disciples who walked with Jesus, who listened to his teaching, who witnessed him perform miracles, signs and wonders, multiplying food, 
raising the dead, opening blinded eyes and so on. I mean, the excitement must have been amazing hanging out with Jesus, right? These guys that had all of that experience with him and saw all this stuff went into the same town. The people in that town had the same open heart towards God and the possibilities of the Messiah coming as what the, it's the same people that this woman went in and spoke to. And these guys walked amongst them. And what did they do? Well, we're just simply here to buy food. We're just here to buy food. I mean, if it was, if it was a Sunday at church, yeah, I'd probably get a bit excited about Jesus. You know? If, if, it was a, if it was a Friday afternoon when we do evangelism downtown, then maybe I'd talk to someone about Jesus, you know, the, the sort of 8 to 10 o'clock, two-hour evangelism slot that some churches will do, and, you know, 9.59, and I'm telling you about Jesus, and then the Son of God came, and he did, oh, 10 o'clock, sorry, time over, it's back to my time now. Thanks for listening. We'll be back here next week at 8 o'clock. Jesus said to him, lift up your eyes and have a look. Have a look. The fields are ripe. You're telling yourself that I'm waiting for a time down the track when the fields will become ripe. And Jesus is saying the fields are ripe now. The problem is not the ripeness of the fields. It's that you're walking around with your eyes down. You're walking around with your head down. You're so consumed with whatever the task of your day or the task of our life is that you don't notice the need of the people around us that we don't recognize the spiritual hunger that actually exists in the world around us, that we don't recognize the hunger that exists in the community around us. The disciples were going about their business and they didn't see any of the openness in town when they were there. They just went through the motions of whatever the task was at hand. They were just happy to shop and sometimes we're just happy to go to work. I'm just happy to go and play sport. I'm just happy to go and put fuel in the car. I'm just happy to go for my walk. I'm just happy to go to the beach. I'm just happy to, I'm just happy to, I'm just happy to, and my eyes are down. What if in those moments, Jesus is tapping us on the shoulder going, see that person over there, that, 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 that's a field ripe for harvest right there. Who, who, who's going to recognize that? Who's going to see that the fields are ripe for harvest? Who's going to recognize that we're not waiting for something else down the track? We can stand here and we can pray, Lord, we're praying for a revival like the world has never seen. Let's pray for a revival, that's awesome. But let's recognize, too, that while we're praying for something to happen, look around for the answer. Look around for the answer. It's like in, uh, in, 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 in the book of Acts when I think it was Peter was thrown in prison. And uh, it says that, 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 that the people gathered at this house. You'll probably know the story. And, and this prayer gathering gathered. Well, Peter's in prison. Let's get together. We're going to pray for Peter. We're going to pray for the release of Peter. And they're beckoning God, Lord, open prison. Get Peter out, Lord. We're praying protection over Peter, Lord. He's a great man of God. He's preaching the gospel. Father, would you bind the hands of the enemy, Lord? Would you, would you silence the voice of the Romans? Would you put the swords away? Would you set him free? Would you give him favor? Would you, all this stuff. And then all of a sudden... There's a knock at the door. Because while they're praying, what happened? Well, it says that Peter's sitting there and all of a sudden he, he, he doesn't realize it's really happening. He's in a bit of a, thinks he's in a bit of a dream state. So he kind of opens his eyes and the shackles come off and, and that. And, and then the prison door opens and he's walking past guards and they can't see him. And he gets out the front and the prison gates open. He's standing in the street thinking, I'm having a dream. Then all of a sudden he goes, oh, wow, that actually happened. That's cool, you know? And so he takes off to this house to, to, um, and he knocks on the door with his prayer meetings going on and it says that there was a, I think it was a, a servant girl called Rhoda or somebody uh, comes up to the door and says, who is it? And she hears this voice, it's Peter. She's so pumped, she doesn't even open the door. She runs back into all the, she runs back into the mature believers who are praying. It says, hey everybody, it's Peter. And they say, it can't be Peter, he's in prison, that's why we're praying. She goes back and goes, I'm pretty sure it's Peter. And of course, they open the door and guess what? There's Peter. Well, we can be like that too, can't we? We can, we, can, we, can, we can pray, but not necessarily be open to the answer of our prayer. I think, I think the best way to pray is pray, then lift your eyes up and look for the answer to the prayer. Because if I'm going to pray and I'm really believing that God does things through prayer, then I'm going to lift up my eyes when I get up off my knees or whatever it is, position you, whatever you're praying, I'm going to get my eyes up and I'm going to look and go, right, I've just asked for this, Father. You're a faithful Father. So now I'm looking for the answer. The answer may be, no, that's okay, but I'm looking for the answer. Otherwise, why am I praying? <laughs> See, we can be exactly like those disciples. We can be so caught up in the natural world. We can be so caught up in our work, our hobbies, our sport, our passions, our families, our friends, 
our hurts, our disappointments, our limitations, our dreams, our hopes. We can be so caught up in those things that we pay very little attention to the spiritual dimensions and what's going on around us. We're consumed with the affairs of men, while largely we can be ignorant of the affairs of God. Yet God wants to do great things, amen? God wants to do great things in our community. God loves me. He doesn't love me any better than the person that's sitting at a bar this morning drinking their life away because they don't know how to cope. You know? God loves each of us in here right now, but he doesn't love us any more than the person that's downtown waking up now after a cold night with no blanket over them. He loves us in this room, but he doesn't love us any more than the rich tycoon who, who's pushing his wife and his kids away because he has zero ability to cope with the success that he's had in life. So he's hurting those closest to him. And God loves these people as much as he loves us. And he calls us as his followers to continue the work of Jesus. The binding up of the brokenhearted. The setting of captives free. Opening blinded eyes. All those things. It's interesting in, um, in, in, in Luke. Luke writes the book of Luke and then he follows up with volume 2, which we call the book of Acts. And the very first verse of the book of Acts it says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, this guy Theophilus that he was writing these two books to, he says, the former account I made, O excellent Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. All that Jesus began. Jesus is dead. He doesn't say all that Jesus did and taught. He says, I wrote you an account of what Jesus began to do and teach. Now I'm going to write you an account of what Jesus continues to do and teach but Jesus isn't doing it. He's doing it through his body, the church. Amen? The preaching of the gospel, the, the ministering to those that are in need, the, the loving of the unlovable, the touching the untouchable, the, 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 the showing the hopeless that they have a hope in God. I love that. It's one of my favorite verses. All that Jesus began to do and to teach, and I go, I, I'm that part. I'm the part of that story that says all that Jesus continued to do and teach. I'm part of the continuing generation. Sometimes I wish I was part of the began generation. You know, I want to walk with Jesus. I want to, I want to be there. I want, to, I want to be a part of all the excitement and so on. I wish I was part of the began generation. And I could have been, if it was in the ordained will of God, he could have made me born back then. I could have been part of the began generation. But Jesus, for whatever reason, in his divine ordination and, 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 and picture and layout of, of eternity, I'm going to create here, it's going to end there. And in between here, I've got all these things. I'm going to make, give people their times and their seasons and their boundaries and their places. For whatever reason, I'm not in the began generation. I'm in the continuous continued generation and each of us are part of that continued generation but do we recognize that and do we accept that invitation from the spirit or are we happy like the disciples to just put our head down go into town and just do the shopping and miss the opportunity to be a part of bringing a whole bunch of people out to him I, I, I think we're born for more we've got our little slogan within our movement I see born for more I think we are born for more and I think that's a big big part of the more we're born for I, I, I want us all to be successful in life I want you to have the best marriages that, 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 that are possible here on planet Earth. I want you to raise your kids the best, be the best parents, the best example of parents. Those of you in business, I want you to be the best, most integrous business people that this country's ever seen. I want God to bless everyone in this room uh, uh, mentally. I want you to just have incredible mental prowess and creativity to, and problems. So I, I want that for you to be able to think through the issues of life with clarity. I want you to have health, great health, so you can enjoy this gift of life that God gave to you. I want you to have the best relationships, the best friendships and so on. I want us to have that. I want us to, to be spiritually in tune and switched on and, 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 and on fire and, and really grounded in our faith. I want you to be blessed financially. I want God to just be the kind of person that God can just chuck buckets of money upon you because he knows if he gets it to you, he's going to get it through you and you're not just going to build a bigger barn and go, what should I do with all this? Well, I haven't got enough room to hold it. I'll build another barn so I can keep even more of it to myself. I want God to bless us in all of those areas in all those ways. I really do. But... But that's not what it's all about. It's a part of it, but it's not what it's all about. It's not what it's all about. As long as there are people walking around in the community that, that are alienated from God and, and don't know Jesus, then there's got to be a part of the mission of the church. Jesus said 2,000 years ago to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And lo, I'll be with you till the very end of the age. As you go, as you do these things, as you be part of the continue to do generation, I will be with you till the very end of the age. Notice he said to the very end of the age. He didn't say to the 12, go into all the world, preach the gospel. When you guys die, that'll be enough. Let's just see what happens. 
Let's just hope you've planted enough, you know. It's like when you do your lawn, no? You, 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 I was talking to a guy the other day and he was telling me that his neighbour's got Sir Walter. So, I can't remember, it was probably one of you guys here. And, uh, and, and, and you don't, you didn't have Sir Walter. And so you was, your neighbour went to cut it and he said, no, no, don't, because it's starting to creep across onto your lawn and you just want all the Sir Walter that he paid for and nurtured and cared about and you just want it for nothing. <laughs> I didn't use your name, so you can't be mad at me. Hey, um, McCrindle. McCrindle do a lot of research in this country into uh, the community and the state of the church and how, how the world, how the Australian community view churches. They did one in, 19, uh, in uh, 2021, was the last one. It was in the middle of the pandemic, but here were some of the stats they found. They said that many Australians back in that, that stage, and they're not talking about people in churches, many Australians are experiencing a renewed search for spiritual reality. They found that 47% of people thought more about the meaning of life when they went through the trauma of COVID. 47% of people thought more about their own mortality. 33% thought more about God. And one in three people prayed. Even if they didn't know God was there. Even if they didn't have a basis of faith, but they would shoot a prayer up to the man upstairs. You know? Like my dad would say, the, the big guy up there, you know? They would shoot a prayer up to him. See, eternity is still in the hearts of man. Eternity is still in the hearts of men. I don't care what the media says. I don't care uh, how, 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 how much they take Jesus out of society. You can't read a Bible here. You can't pray there. You can take all of that stuff out. You can shut down the, the voice of the church. You can, you can shut down the name of Jesus. You can, you can uh, not let us uh, pray. You can shut down religious organizations across the country. You can take away uh, tax exemption statuses. All these things that governments and, and certain particular political parties are wanting to do to come against the church, thinking that they're going to kill the church, you'll never kill the church firstly because you can't stop God you can't stop his spirit you can't contain it therefore you can't control it God's going to keep doing what God does but at the end of the day as long as eternity is in the hearts of men people are going to search for something they're going to search for something okay they're going to search they're going to keep drinking because it's a search for something they're going to keep probably sticking needles in their arms because it's a search for something they're going to keep looking at things online they shouldn't be looking at because it's a search for something they're going to keep diving into mysticism and new age, waving crystals around their head, putting tin foil on their head, trying to get messages from aliens because they're searching for something. People are going to keep looking because as, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3, God has placed eternity in the heart of man. Yeah. See, the fields are ripe for harvest because eternity is there. There's something in the heart of man that's searching and seeking. And as long as that's in the heart of men, it's why Jesus said, go into all the world, preach to God, and I'll be with you till the end of the age. He didn't just say preach for a certain point, then church, you stop, and you just enjoy yourselves down here because you've done it. Hey, he didn't. He said, no, 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 there's got to be something in the heart of God's people that realizes that while we're down here, let's enjoy, let's love, let's all, but hey, let's live with a sense of mission as well, that there's a world out there that needs Jesus. 76% of Australians still believe that local churches in their community are a good thing. Not only are they a good thing, but they actually believe they make a positive difference to the community. 76% of people in Australian communities that were surveyed believe that having a church in their community is good and that those churches have the potential to do good things. Eternity is in the heart of man still. There's something about God. There's something about Jesus that's still attractive. Even if people don't recognize it out there, there's something in here. There's something in here. You know what? It's 20 past 11. I'm going to finish up there. Didn't even get a chance to touch on what we were going to talk about. That's okay. That happens so often here. I'll get the band back. Get the band back. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, I'll finish with this. So anyway, all that stuff I said at the start that I was going to talk about time, uh, give me some more time next week and come back and we'll do it again. We'll cover it then. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. We just looked at a couple of verses from here. It says, By grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Who's, who's, who would say that describes their life? So some, the rest of you are saved by works. Awesome, good on you. Write a book. I want to read it. I'm saved by grace through faith. I need Jesus. And Jesus hasn't made me perfect. I still am human. Wish I wasn't, you know? My wife hung up on me the other day and I didn't go, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Put the foot down. I thought, I'm getting away from you. Catch me. I didn't really do that. 
because I knew it would land at home with her and she'd still catch up with me. So, I'm saved by grace through faith. It's not of myself, it's a gift of God. But look what he says in the very next verse. Verse 10. He says, for we are his workmanship. And he says this, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works. And I love this last bit. Don't skip over this last bit. Meditate on this. I want you to think about this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. You are his workmanship created by God. For good works, which God prepared beforehand. Think about that. In other words, before you got here, there was this good work. It was already prepared. And God went, I've got this thing here that I want to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to custom make something that can do that good work. And then he put Patrick on a clay thing or whatever and did his stuff and obviously pressed pretty hard at the front of the head there and rubbed all the hair off. <laughs> and produced this incredible man that, that in his 30s, was it in your 30s when you came to faith? 34. 34 years of age, finally. Penny drops for Patrick and he goes, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, I need this. Yeah. And he surrenders his life to Jesus. And then God goes, right, what I want you to know, Patrick, is I've created you for good works. The work was already there. I've just been waiting for you to on board with me. Now you're on board with me, Patrick. Walk with me. Here's what I want you to do. It's like, think about a shovel, the first person that ever created a shovel. Who thinks shovels are good things? I think shovels are amazing. You know? I like, I like where's Booksy? I like your backhoe way better because it does the same job quicker. Can you imagine a guy got a piece of metal one day and he just started whacking it? <laughs> Made this flat bit of metal and another guy said, oh, I've got a stick. Let's stick it on the end. You! Yeah, awesome. And then one of them said, what is it? And they were, we don't know. It doesn't look good. What should we do with it now? I don't know. No, no, no. Somebody looked at the ground one day and went, I've got to move that. And I'm like, oh. I got no fingernails left. My wife won't let me use the spoons. How am I going to move that? Somebody went, okay, let's have a look at that. I reckon we need something that's like skinny, maybe a bit pointed at the front, so it can, and then, and then you probably let's put some flat bits on it so you can put some pressure on it, really drive it into the ground. And then we need a big long arm so you don't have to sort of bend down. And, and then so they made something there, and then all of a sudden, bang, they start shoveling out dirt. Well. The work, the good work was there first and then they custom made something. And I want you to think about this. You're a custom made for something. Amen. I don't know what the something is. I'm not God. But you are custom made for something. You are custom made for a purpose. We, we, we went and picked up this car the other day and it was like a you know, nice car, but it's a, you know, there's, there's hundreds of those cars. But, but, but this was not like that. Like You're a custom built car. You're custom made for good works. And I, I, I know that you've probably got some great good works and things that you do and stuff that you like and things that really benefit your life and so on. But I want to challenge you today, each of us in this room, that, that have you ever stopped and said to God, just a simple question, just asked him the simple question, Lord, I know what my parents wanted me to do with my life. God, I know what society told me to do with my life. I know because I was really smart, I assumed I had to go to university and get a degree and go down this path. I knew that. I knew that I was really good at, at talking people into things, so I became a salesman. So, like, we've got all this stuff, but have we ever stopped and gone, God, what, what have you actually built me for? What's the good work? Because, God, I believe there's a good work there. I believe there's some divine purpose. There's something that's going to build the kingdom of God that you've called me to, Lord. What is that? I wonder if we've ever taken time to ask God that question. We did it 19, and took us to India. It was awesome. Then it brought us back to Australia and landed us here, and guess what? It's awesome. But if God said, go back to India, that'd be awesome. 
because we know that's what he wants. Father, I want to thank you for your word, God. I, 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 God, we're going to talk about time today. Wasn't that a joke? Father, I thank you for each person in this room, Lord. I thank you, God, that, God, each of us are here for a reason and a purpose. God, I thank you that we are custom-built machines for you, Lord. We, we are custom-made, God. And maybe there are people in this room this morning and you, there are things about yourself that you hate and so you resist it and you, you, you try to change it and you're, you're trying to be something different. And maybe the Holy Spirit's saying to you, hey, stop fighting against that thing. L- 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 place it in my hands because I've got, I can do something amazing with you. I can do something amazing with that because you're custom built, you're made for good works. And those good works have been sitting there waiting for you to just come to realize that I've called you to something, that I've gifted you with something, that I have plans and purposes for your life. So Father, I pray for each of us, Lord, in this room. God, I pray as we go home, I pray this week we would meditate on that thought, Ephesians 2. God, I pray that we would sit with it, we would wrestle with it, God. We would ask you the question, Father, well, what, what good works was I made for, God? Lord, what's my contribution to building the kingdom of God in this tiny, tiny little window of opportunity I have down here called life? It's literally here today and it's literally going to be gone before what feels like tomorrow. So God, teach us to number our days. Teach us to redeem time. Teach us to apply ourselves to the things that are going to produce fruit, not just down here on earth, but for eternity. And Lord, I pray in the next seven days as we leave this place, Father, I pray in the next seven days, would you give everybody in this room, every one of us that, that, that say we know Jesus, would you, would you please give every one of us the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with somebody, God. Somebody out there that does not know what you did for them, God. Somebody out there that needs to hear the, the good news, that needs to hear that they are loved, that they are created in God's image, that they are special, that need to hear that Jesus died for them, that need to hear they can have a fresh start in life. God, that need to hear that they can be free of guilt and condemnation. Father, would you give us a chance, God, as your people, give us a chance to speak to some of these people this week and to tell them that good news. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay.